January the 2nd, 2020, 8.36 p.m. British Airways flight BA633 from Athens is minutes from landing at Heathrow Airport. Aircraft was on final approach to London Heathrow, established on the glide slope for 27 right. We entered to tops of a layer of cloud. At the same time, I, as pilot not flying, pilot one, smelt a mild, increasing to moderate smell of sweaty socks or ozone smell. A serious problem is developing, which is why a confidential internal air safety report, or ASR, was completed by the captain after the incident. We're not supposed to see it, and you're not supposed to be hearing it. Pilot flying didn't respond and had started breathing rapidly over the intercom. I asked if he was okay, with no response, and asked again, and he replied a no. By this time, his head was dropping forward and was not really usefully conscious. With the pilot, who is flying the plane, the first officer out of action, the captain takes over. Approximately seven miles to touchdown, immediately donned my oxygen mask and stated that I had control. Pilot two, now fully unresponsive. Mayday call made to London Heathrow Tower, stating pilot incapacitation and intention to land. The Mayday call is used only in times of life-threatening immediate danger. At some point during this time, Pilot 2 had recovered enough to put on their own oxygen mask, but was still unresponsive to the question, are you OK, and still head down, not really moving. The captain lands the plane safely and the passengers disembark normally, probably unaware of the emergency in the cockpit. This is what's known in the airline industry as a fume event. Not all are as serious as this one, but they've become bitterly contested between the airline industry and the people who work for it. While some staff maintain their health is being damaged by exposure to poisonous fumes, including organophosphates, airlines say there is no proof that's the case. Legal action is underway in Germany, Holland, France, the United States and Britain, where the Union Unite is bringing forward 10 test cases this year, which reflect the claims of more than 100 crew. I'll speak to you again on the way to London. Give an update on the weather and a more accurate arrival time. This is Assignment on the BBC World Service. I'm Mike Powell, and for 10 years in the 90s, I flew the world as an air steward. I was trained to respond to all types of emergencies, and I had my fair share. Looking back, we did experience chemical smells, but we didn't register them as fume events, because they weren't recognised then as they are now. But staff are becoming increasingly concerned about fume events. They've been recording incidents themselves. They've also been keeping a list called Angel Fleet of colleagues who have died prematurely. One ex-Concorde pilot, Tristan Lorraine, a leading campaigner to get greater recognition of fume events, has even made a film documentary about it. It's called Everybody Flies. Right now we've got British Airways and Airbus technicians who are working on the plane right now trying to find out the source of a foul smell that passengers... Four flight attendants have filed a lawsuit against Boeing, which supplies planes to many of the world's airlines, accusing the manufacturer of knowing about a defect that allows toxic fumes to leak through the engines and into the cabin. Boeing declined to comment on the suit, but has always insisted cabin air is safe to breathe. So when you're a passenger on an airplane, yeah. where does the air you breathe come from? Oh, oh that's a good point. I don't know. <laughs> it didn't surprise me that the passengers I spoke to didn't know much about the air on planes. Even many crews have no idea where it comes from. The question of where cabin air comes from is an important part of this story. So I turned to Di Whittingham. He's CEO of the UK Flight Safety Committee, which includes the main airlines, cargo carriers and helicopter operators in Britain, as well as the UK regulator, the Civil Aviation Authority. According to Di Whittingham, the most likely source of organophosphates and other chemicals is the engine. The original thinking behind the potential for organophosphate poisoning, aerotoxicity in cabins, was that this was pyrolyzed oil products coming through the labyrinth seals within the engines and leaking into the air conditioning system because the air conditioning for most aircraft is drawn off the engine compressors 
obviously dropped in temperature and pressure, but then goes into the cabin. And that's called the bleed air system. Mm, that is called the bleed air system. Mm-hmm. You bleed air off the engine. It will be well nigh impossible to stop all forms of contaminants getting into an aircraft cabin. The question, I think, becomes how much is too much? And is there a, a level of exposure at which people are being made ill? And that's the sort of research that now needs to be done. I've come to Tynmouth on the south coast of England to meet Fiona and Charlie Bass. Their son Matt died at the age of 34. Well, Matthew had been suffering from an unknown illness and his health had been declining for probably six months or so. And uh, it was difficult to find out what was uh, the cause of it. He'd been to his GP, he'd been to specialists, and he'd just come back from an overnight trip to Ghana and was with some friends. They had some pizza and some wine, and he went to sleep and uh, didn't wake up. When that phone call came, I knew. Being a mum, you just know, you know, that something's not right and, and your whole world is just shattered. I had to go through the motions of burying my youngest son. And he was 34, he was my baby. Since he was eight years old, that's all he ever wanted to do. And he loved his uniform. He was proud of doing his job. And it killed him. It took him away. The um, first post-mortem stated, you know, they, they couldn't understand why he died. Not satisfied with the first post-mortem, Matt's mum and dad paid for a second examination and further separate tests, which indicated that he had had significant exposure to organophosphates. They're now convinced that caused his illnesses and premature death. So we've just come off a very cold, windy and rainy beach back to the warmth of uh, Charlie and Fiona's home, overlooking the sea and the countryside. Yeah, it it sits underneath one of the main transatlantic flight routes. And so when Matt used to fly over, because my parents live here as well, he always used to say, I look down to see where you and Nanny and Grandad are. And my parents and we used to look up and say, I wonder which flight that is, whether Matthew's on that one. And that's all he ever wanted to do. He wanted... Charlie, to build him a a door, a bedroom door, to make it look like an aircraft door. And the day he got the job with EasyJet, he phoned me up and he was absolutely over the moon with excitement. Matt had been feeling unwell for months before he died. He saw his GP and other medical professionals about his symptoms, including digestive problems, fatigue and nausea. And he used to say to me, Mm, we had that funny smell again, Mum. What kind of smell was that? Just a horrible, sweaty feet. Mm. And I used to say to him, OK, maybe it's the air, Matt. And he said, maybe it is. But the coroner didn't actually say that this was the specific cause of Matt's death. No, he didn't. Uh, you're absolutely right. Because the science and the evidence was not there at that point in time. Remembering that Matt's death was five years ago and this was the very very first case that had been brought to court relating to this unite the union wouldn't carry on with the case well they couldn't carry on with the case because the coroner had found that that was not in his view and his expert witnesses that that was the actual cause a primary cause of death so what it did do was raise the question that said we can't definitely say that matthew died because of that But what we can say is that we need to keep an eye on this and make sure that any other crew that do die have the tests that are necessary to show whether they've been exposed to this. So what are these organophosphate chemicals that can end up in aircraft cabins and what harm can they do? I turn to one of the UK's leading experts. I'm Professor Sir Colin Berry. I was formerly chairman of the Advisory Committee on Pesticides. I'm a pathologist by training, but did a great deal of regulatory work in drugs, materials and pesticides. What are organophosphates? They're esters of phosphoric acid, a lot of compounds, different kinds. They're used as pesticides, they're powerful killers of insects and uh, have been used for a very long time, probably since about the 1950s. 
So they've been around for a long time. We've been exposed to them for quite a while. Yes, indeed. Their uses have been progressively restricted over the last three, four decades. If they get into a human body, what effect would they have? The big data we have is from studies of farmers using these as sheep dips. The symptoms are very clear. You get paralysis, you get peripheral neuropathy. Fortunately, it recovers very quickly in the majority of people, though it may last for seven, ten days. But in a small subset of people, you get some permanent changes with peripheral neuropathy, damage to the nerves. And in the survivors of those who've had really toxic doses, quite likely to get some permanent neurological effects. In the worst cases, he says, these could involve poisoning, confusion, convulsions and coma. Two British Airways pilots from the south have died within weeks of each other after blaming exposure to aircraft fumes in the cockpit. BA pilots Karen Lysakowska and Richard Westgate were both in their early 40s. His post-mortem examination showed damage to his heart and nervous system. A coroner, the judicial official who oversees inquests into the causes of deaths in certain circumstances, including poisoning, assessed the autopsy and toxicology reports and ruled that Richard Westgate died of an unintentional sleeping pill overdose. However, another senior coroner issued what's called a Regulation 28 report about the case to the Civil Aviation Authority and British Airways. In the legal document, he stated... In my opinion, there is a risk that future deaths will occur unless action is taken. The matters of concern are as follows. 1. That organophosphate compounds are present in aircraft cabin air. 2. That the occupants of aircraft cabins are exposed to organophosphate compounds with consequential damage to their health. 3. That impairment to the health of those controlling aircraft may lead to the death of occupants. 4. There is no real-time monitoring to detect such compounds in cabin air. 5. That no account is taken of genetic variation in the human species, such as would render individuals tolerant or intolerant of the exposure. He concluded that action should be taken. Three years after that guidance, another senior coroner sent a confidential letter of guidance prompted by the inquest into the death of Matt Bass to all coroners in England and Wales. Assignment has seen that confidential letter. It says that should coroners be faced with a death involving a relatively young person who's a frequent flyer who dies in unexplained or complex circumstances, they may wish to consider the need for further post-mortem tests and the retention of samples. In a statement, British Airways told us we would never operate an aircraft if we believed it posed any health or safety risk to our customers or crew. We always encourage our colleagues to tell us about any concerns they have. Fume events vary in type, sometimes the smoke, sometimes just an unpleasant smell. Sometimes only the crew are affected, sometimes it's passengers too. No one really knows how frequently fume events occur. Estimates vary. A veteran of the UK's Air Accidents Investigation Branch told us they happen at least twice a day. A US study found that there were at least five a day in that country alone. And the European Aviation Safety Agency, or EASA, has reported more than 100 serious fume incidents within its remit in both 2017 and 2018. I put it to Di Whittingham of the UK Flight Safety Committee that the industry has played down incidents of fume events. When you come down to the number of flights, it's comparatively rare. I don't believe any of the operators are uh, ignoring what's going on. But it is very difficult as an operator when you are faced with something that you cannot detect uh, after the event. There may be differences in susceptibility, there may be differences in tolerance, but at, at the moment that's an area of medicine that um, is not being explored. Why not? Are the airlines not investing in that side of things? I think the airlines will probably be looking at the the repeated studies that have gone on over the last 20 years that have not definitively made a link between uh, the presence of organophosphates and 
this so-called erotoxic syndrome. That uh, is not to deny the potential existence of it, but they will be looking at the fact that uh, they have a, I suppose at some stage will be a significant investment, but they also have a workforce to protect. The alarm is being raised by pilots and cabin crew, and as we've heard from passengers now as well, these are the very people who the industry expects us to trust on board the aircraft for the safety to get us through the skies. When they flag up concerns about fume events and aerotoxicity, should we listen to them? I I think you should always listen to people. Uh, The fume events are being tracked by the uh, Air Accident Investigation Branch and other safety investigating bodies. What I'm less clear about is just how many people are allegedly affected by this. Uh, And I use that word deliberately. Uh, There is no denying that they've been affected. The question is by what? Interesting you say about the fume events being registered by the Air Accident Investigations Branch, because there is no official fume event register, is there? And Not in those terms. Uh, There are means of getting the data if you have um, cause to do so. All, All that data is now going into the European Central Repository, which means the uh, Civil Aviation Authority, the National Aviation Authorities can get hold of it, um, as can the operators. Quite recently in the US, the Cabin Air Safety Act of 2019 was introduced to create an online searchable fume event database. Do you see the benefit of having something like that here in the UK? I suppose you could do it. Uh, Whether the FAA is mandated to do that uh, remains to be seen. There is a big programme going on in Europe called Data for Safety where all these um, safety events will be searchable and categorised. And will the public be able to have access to that to see how many fume events there have been registered? Uh, I I don't know, personally. Uh, The the public um, can get access to some data. The the specifics are obviously not. So you will not know, for example, that it was um, a 737 uh, on the 26th of March 2019 and it was operated by uh, whichever operator. You, you won't, you won't get, know that. You will not know that. Because? Because that information is always protected. The solution to toxic cabin air achieving a better environment inside planes may lie in industry efforts to reduce the impact of air travel outside aircraft to be more environmentally friendly. When it comes to innovation in aircraft design and new technology, Cranfield Aerospace is a national leader. Working with the biggest names in aviation from around the world to develop prototypes, test new models and ensure everything they come up with complies with the regulator's guidelines. I'm on my way to the company's headquarters to meet their CEO, Paul Hutton. What you can see here is um, our work facility, which is a 1930s hangar. Um, I think the first photographs that we've got of aircraft being worked on in this hangar are Lancaster bombers. Today, we're very much focused on uh, the green revolution in aerospace. If we carry on... uh, No, you can't go... On the hangar floor. Sorry, so we have to keep on the the red walkways for safety. So just okay. carry on along here. Talk us through as we come through the hangar. Okay, as we go past the uh, past this uh, shelving here, at the front of the hangar, you can see. So we're standing by the engine of a jet here, Paul. Maybe you could just explain to us uh, how the engine works and how it kind of draws in air into the cabin. I mean, essentially, a, a conventional engine, a jet engine, is um, mixing the air that you get uh, in the atmosphere with the propellant, the jet fuel, or in some cases, some aircraft, avgas, in order to provide the propulsion. So the, the air that's injected into the cabin, there's always a risk that that air gets uh, mixed up and that can cause pollutants into the cabin. That problem starts to disappear as you move to pure green technologies because if you're using pure battery, for example then there is uh, absolutely no emissions. If you're using something like a hydrogen fuel cell, uh, the outputs are just water. So there aren't any noxious uh, propellants that will cause that sort of problem. So whilst these green technologies are not being developed specifically to address 
any problems with bleed air into cabins. They potentially do help to make that, that problem reduce or, in fact, go away. Now, what we see here in this walled-off area, um, which unfortunately we can't go in because it's commercially sensitive, is the first prototype of what's called an air taxi. That's an electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircraft being developed by for one of our customers. It's designed to carry between three and five people, and it has uh, what would looks like a conventional wing, but that wing can rotate to the vertical. And, of course, at the same time, we're replacing conventional propulsion with electric or hybrid electric propulsion to start the journey of going green with aircraft, which is a must. Uh, we're talking about six-plus years to get uh, these into passenger carrying service. How long until commercial airliners would use this kind of technology? It's likely to be two or three decades before we get these sort of technologies turning those uh, types of aircraft completely green. In years to come, then, toxic cabin air may disappear. The chance of oil leaking into the cabin will diminish as we move away from fossil fuels. The UK regulator, the Civil Aviation Authority, said in a statement that the research upon which they rely shows no evidence of a link between exposure to contaminants in cabin air and possible acute and long-term health effects, although such a link cannot be excluded. So how might a possible link be investigated? Professor Sir Colin Berry says a proper assessment of long-term build-up would require air crew cooperation. What one would need to do is document whether there is build-up. The only way you can do that sensibly is a fat biopsy, which is uh, not as grim as it sounds. You can needle a bit of fat from the anterior abdominal wall and see whether there are compounds in there. I don't think many people would volunteer for a study where every year they had their fat biopsied, but I, as a scientist, you think that's what I'd like to do to discover what's going on here. So you think that crew, frequent flyers, pilots who are concerned about this should be doing that? Well, if you are that concerned, then that is not a silly thing to think about. A growing number of people are saying that they're highly concerned by the amount of fume events that are happening on board the aircraft. And what would be your response to that? Do you think that people are getting worried for no reason? If there is a fume event, what should happen is that some measurement should be made of what has been deposited on relevant surfaces in the plane. That's the data you need to be able to make any sort of sensible statement. What you could do is simply swab any plane surface, not absorbent surface in the plane. That would tell you, if there have been fumes in there, whether the compounds were present or not. And that, I think, in some ways is the first step. And what levels are acceptable? I don't think any level is acceptable. That's why these compounds have been steadily removed from garden use, for example. Swabbing the insides of aircraft is exactly what some cabin crew have been doing. They say detecting contaminants. All this in preparation for court action. Unite, the airline union driving the litigation, says they're determined not to settle out of court, but to ensure the public gets to hear all of the evidence. So let's return to the UK Flight Safety Committee, which numbers airlines, manufacturers and regulators among its members. I asked the committee CEO, Di Whittingham, about the industry's unwillingness to discuss the issue in public. The operators are not going to volunteer for the guardroom in terms of uh, spending time and resources on a problem that they may not necessarily think is sufficiently serious. I've spoken to loads of people in the industry and we're talking about uh, captains who are very educated people, very intelligent, they're in command, they're raising concerns, crew are raising concerns, passengers are raising concerns and politicians are doing likewise. Surely we've now come to the stage where this has rumbled on for far too long you're uh, you're correct in that uh, the pilots and the flight crew um they're by definition not idiots they're educated and highly trained people and uh, i have no doubt that um, those of them who have concerns uh, have um sincerely held beliefs for doing that the operators themselves um and the manufacturers I am sure if they are presented with the information, 
that there is a problem. In other words, more evidence, then um, it will be dealt with. But at the moment, what they're not seeing is sufficient scientific evidence that, that would warrant the level of not just uh, investment in, in cash terms, but in resources terms, to get this dealt with. Uh, and that will be contingent on the, the level of exposure of people uh, across the travelling public. We asked to interview British Airways, EasyJet, Lufthansa and Ryanair. No one was available. It was the same with aircraft manufacturers Boeing, Airbus and Bombardier. Likewise, the regulators, the CAA in Britain, EASA in Europe and the FAA in America. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to brief you on the safety procedures of this aircraft. Fume events continue. In the past few days, another British Airways A320 has been involved in its third fume event in just five months. In one event, both pilots were partially incapacitated. Aircrew feel they're risking their jobs when they tell us about such incidents, while they wait to see whether courts across the world will support their claims. Thanks for listening to this podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Mike Powell. The producer was Paul Waters. If you enjoyed this programme, there are lots more to choose from on the Assignment website.